two very exciting guests today, uh, Nikki Hollander and David Park, coming from Southern California. Um, they'll, I'll let them tell you what they do. They have a, a, a very high-level training center down there. Yes. Hey, David. Hey, Nikki. How are you guys doing? Good, Don. How are you, mate? Very good. Yeah, very, very good. Um, I'd like to start this out with a bang right away. Uh, Nikki, David, uh, whichever one of you wants to go first, let me have you guys introdu introduce yourselves and uh, a, little bit of, uh, a little bit of your background, if you would, please. Yeah, Nikki can go first. first. Uh, okay, so uh, my name is Nikki Hollander. Um, I'm an ex-professional uh, soccer player from England, played in England, played in Scandinavia, and then came out to... Uh, America was with the Los Angeles Galaxy second team, got injured and began uh, a path of um, training people, fitness training, uh, primarily at the beginning, performance and fitness training. Uh, started off with a lot of kind of Hollywood actors and that kind of stuff. And because of my soccer background, one, um, after a couple of years of doing it, Somebody had told me that Solomon Kalou um, from uh, Chelsea was coming out to uh, LA and wanted a trainer, uh, wanted to train in his off season. And I was like, oh, I can do that. So started uh, working with him and uh, started to develop what I was doing, not just physically, but also working on his technical game, working on his uh, tactical and understanding and bringing kind of almost, like I said, I've taken my badges and stuff, but almost self-teaching myself how to train um, uh, somebody for their personal performance. Because a lot of coaches like Jurgen Klopp, um, uh, Pep Guardiola, uh, Pochettino, Solskjaer, they're all, of course, very good at understanding tactical uh, uh, analysis and how to put the best team out there. But what I was really doing was developing my ability to train somebody completely from the inside out technically as in how they manipulate the ball tactically about the choices they make and where how they position themselves physically about the speed the physicality the endurance they have and then mentally about how um that they perceive uh confidence and how they perceive what their objectives and different stuff like that so i built that kind of up and i started with solomon and then you know he won the Champions League, and then through that, I got more players like Stephen Ireland and Victor Nietzsche And then it got to like modern times now where I train uh, Divo Carigi, Nathan Redman, uh, Josh King, Christian Benteke, and a lot of players from there, as well as a lot of players from the MLS like Corey Baird, uh, Wilson Harris, um, and, and different people like that. So, so, and I started my company, SPI, of course, SPI Training, which stands for sports performance improvement company and and that's where i met david i started uh, i met david i was training him he was a professional player playing in the oc and uh, uh basically he came to train with me and and, and learn under me all of the things that i was doing in terms of like i say the personal performance training for an individual player and then he started spi uh, oc which is now flying along with like I think about 30 high level plays in the OC and David, you can, you can, you can tell the rest about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, Nikki's Nikki's my mentor. And also um, I'm, you know, I'm learning everything from him. Um, my personal background, uh, I went through all levels of soccer in the U S starting from uh, starting from AYSO. I don't know if you guys are aware, uh, know that it's like the lowest recreational level. Uh, was able to get in. Was able to go up to high school, then the academy, then college, NCAA Division One. Then I play pro, uh, further my experience a bit in Europe, and now I'm here. I'm I'm more passionate uh, about training uh, young youth players, just like you guys. Um, and we have SPI has a lot of success stories uh, with players going into the highest level in college, and also professional level in the U.S. as well. Um, and I also run another company where I help players locally and globally uh, prepare for college um, uh, in many other ways, just other than training itself. So that's how, that, that's who we are. Thank you, David. Yeah, and so we connected. We connected with each other. We're now uh, helping some of their players go on. We just placed Caleb Sa at uh, number fifteen in the country, Missouri State, and so 
that's kind of what we're doing now. So this kind of connected. So my question to you guys is really about what these young men and women should be doing physically, right? To, to be able to prepare for the college level. I think that players don't understand what a brutal physical game this can be, how strong you have to be, how quick things happen on the field. And I just, we see a lot of, you know, players coming into college that just aren't prepared. So first question I've got for you guys is what are the most common physical deficiencies you guys see? And we're talking about in the, you know, the seven, the, the 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds, the kids that are just on that cusp of going to college um, and the players wanting to, to play at that top collegiate level. What do you guys see when they come to you? Uh, uh, is there a commonality in the deficiencies or, or is it very unique? Well, I think that it, everybody takes the, the kind of abilities and the, and the talents they have and, and puts them out in, in the way that best suits the, the, the genetic makeup of their body. So Devo Karigi plays very differently than Jordan Henderson. One is extremely fast and powerful. The other one has really good endurance and, you know, can run all day. So I think you have a body type that has a kind of... Uh, which may be uh, predisposed to, to being able to, to do something really well. What I would say is to be a great player, you need three basic pillars in, in our opinion. You need speed, power, and technique. Those three pillars, without those three pillars, you cannot be a great player. Um, and so I, I, tr I always tend to say this. I, I don't like when we talk about college players as opposed to pro players as opposed to different i like to just say every player needs to reach their potential and if your potential is a college player then that's fantastic if you're if you go beyond that and suddenly now you're looking at a pro career then that's great but i don't think you train differently for college than you would for something else i think you just train to reach your potential and you reach to and you look to fill in all the things that you need so what a common thing I see is that people come to us and they, of course, they want to be fit and they want to be strong. But what, what, what you need is those pillars. So the first thing you need is you need power. You need that power in your body to be able to generate force um, uh, and be able to push a really high load. Because the more you can push, the faster you can go somewhere. And the lighter you are and the stronger you can push, the better it is. So there's a lot of people that want to bulk up and get really big. But as I tell them, bulking up just really means that your body has to push more weight through time and space to get somewhere. So really, you actually want to be as light as possible and as powerful as possible. That's really a soccer player's body. And so, so in the, when people come to us, it depends where they are in their season. But if they're in their off season, what kids should be working at and what players should be working at is two things. So depending on your age, about 14, you start to work, you can start to work on real power movements, but you want to start to be able to lift um, weights uh, to, to set your kind of base power. So you want to, to increase that power load. So you have a good foundation for where your speed comes from. And I think you do that. And then you need to turn that into a speed. So speed is then how quickly you can move that force. But speed can have so many elements to it, right? Because speed can be the neuromuscular connection, how fast the signal can go from your brain to your muscles. It can be how fast your muscles can contract. Also, speed can be how fast you can slow down. A lot of people think about speed being about how fast you accelerate. But actually, what they're finding is that soccer is a deceleratory sport, which means it's less about how fast you accelerate and more about how fast you can decelerate. So a lot of plays, when you, they change direction, everyone's like, oh, they explode so quickly. But what they really are doing is actually decelerating so quickly and then changing direction. And so we work a lot on deceleration. And kids today don't work a lot on deceleration, which is how slowly and how controlled you can do the eccentric movement. An eccentric movement, guys, is about how slowly and controlled you can lengthen your muscles. So it, it, I take it like this. Imagine you were stepping up onto a box. The opposite of that would be how slowly you can step down off that box, how your muscles can control itself. And so when you do things, I see a lot of people, they do like, let's just take um, sprint races. Let's say you did a 40-meter run. 
That's excellent. Okay. That's about how fast you can accelerate. But now we need to see how fast you de can decelerate. So that's why I always put a change of direction in there. So the doggies, or we call them doggies in England. I think you might call them suicides in America, which is how fast you sprint and come back. Because that takes into account how you change direction, how you take all of your force going one way and turn it around and bring it back the other way. That involves acceleration, how fast you explode, but it also involves deceleration, how quickly you can stop your body's force and change it around. So we work on that. One of the biggest things, though, I, I think I want to impart to you kids is this. A lot of people come to us and they go, I need to get fit. I need to get match fit. I want to get match fit. You only need to be match fit when you're in a season. Okay? When you're not in this, because match fitness, really, what match fitness is, is it's reactive fitness. What, what that really means is, in a game, you have to react to, to move at moments when you might be fatigued and tired. So somebody might, you might be playing, you might do a great run up the wing, cross the ball, they get it and they turn around and they start attacking. Now you have reactive fitness. You must react before you are ready to get back and defend. And so you need to then start to build that part of your game up, the reactive fitness part. But you only really need that when we're coming into games. But that's why when the pro players come to us in the off season, we don't do like loads of running or different things like that. The first thing we do is we take two or three weeks and we identify what we can get better. So it might be like, can we make you faster over five meters? Can we make you more powerful? Can we make your change of direction? And we take a topic that we can improve on. Then as they're getting, then as they're starting to get closer to going back to their preseason, then I'll start to add some fitness elements to it because I want them to hit the ground running in preseason. And then preseason with their teams is where they will really start to get that reactive fitness and the drill fitness where they'll be able to start um, working on their anaerobic threshold, which is how their body flushes lactic acid. So when you can't do something because you become, you, your muscles become really tight and, and sore and painful, that is the, you getting to the anaerobic threshold. And so that's when, that's what you're really training. When you start to get match fit is you're teaching your body to flush lactic lactate, which is, the waste product in the, in the muscles, you're teaching your body to get rid of that. And you do that by taking yourself to a point where it's just a little bit too hard for you and you start to run out of breath and your body starts to work at becoming efficient at getting that out. And the lactate, that sore feeling in your muscles comes out of your body by breathing in oxygen and then breathing out carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide leaving your body is that lactate getting kind of dispelled so the breathing out is almost as important as the breathing in part of it and that's the kind of thing that you work on in pre-season and then as you then start to get the last week of pre-season where they're doing kind of like um uh, uh exhibition games and then the first week or two of the season that's where you get your match fitness so there is a progression but you don't want to go into the off season and suddenly start working on your match fitness because you don't need it then that is the point where you can take parts of your game that you really need to work on and get better and get the maximum speed or get maximum power and leave the other stuff to the preseason and closer to coming back into, uh, into your season. So that's kind of, that's, that's a little bit of what we, what we try to do. No, I, I think you're exactly right. And we've always called it as coaches, we've always called it change of pace, right? And we've always noticed that, that the players that, that truly make it to the pro level have that, change of pace and to simplify it i call it zero to 60 60 to zero you know mm, like you that, can yeah. accelerate decelerate accelerate decelerate and and that change of pace it's spot on and and i do notice nikki that yeah not a lot of coaches work on it um in the off season as much as they should and i think that that's really good information for for players um okay so now let's let's really simplify this nikki and david look we see guys that make it pro, and, and I've watched uh, and, and tracked a number of kids through their career that, that made it overseas. Kids like Kamani Hill, who was over at Wolfsburg for a while and had a good career in the MLS. And I, and I watched these kids growing up, and I noticed things that they were doing differently that other players weren't doing. A, a lot of players that you guys run across, I'm sure, have a lot of talk 
about the things they want to do, but, but they aren't putting it into action every day. Are there maybe one or two common things that you notice that those that end up making it are doing uh, from a physical aspect on a regular basis as opposed to those that, that never seem to make it? Um, well, I would say that you, of course, like I've said, you need the pillars, but remember if you react and, and, and if you, if I think physical, um, ability is very important, but if somebody has a much better understanding or tactical analysis of the game as they're playing and they see the moment to run one second before somebody else in one second, they've probably taken about six meters. In a, in a soccer game, you're not really ever running more than about at full speed, 30 meters, I think. Maybe a, maybe a wing back might do a 40 meter run, but that's a long run even for, that, for those guys. So if you are seeing the moments to run and identifying the moments to go before other players, that is huge. You don't need them to have, not only don't you need to have the speed, but that is really the biggest differential because suddenly you're getting a five meter race. In a five-meter race, I could beat Divock Origi. In a, in, if we were running 50, 15 to 20 meters, if I got a five-meter head start, he would find it hard to beat me. And he's, he's the sixth fastest in the Premier League. So I think a lot of times I see that people want to get fast. And of course, you've got to want to get faster. You have to be as explosive as you can. You want to beat people off the dribble. But identifying when to, when to sprint, when to change direction, when you can take a back foot, take and explode through a hole. I, I keep telling so many of my players, if you receive the ball with your body half turned and look behind you and you identify that you can take the ball with your back foot and accelerate, you never have to beat a player in your, in your life because you can always just explode through a hole and you never really have to, uh, and you never really have to use that raw physical uh, kind of speed to break through it. Now, Having said that, of course, we want to have physical speed and we want to work at that. But that's not usually why, why people fail. I tend to feel people fail because they misidentify when to go and when not to go. When is the time to sprint? When is the time not to sprint? And the margins are so small. So I was just reviewing, um, I was reviewing one of my, one of my players played against Atletico Madrid. Um, in the uh, in the Champions League, and I it was the best defensive team I've ever seen play, and I it was remarkable to me how little time they had to identify when to go and when not to go. If they misidentified by even the most millimeter of a second, Atletico Madrid had everybody back in place, and so the higher up you get, those margins become smaller, but the biggest thing to breaking down a, a team or breaking down a great defensive team is the identification of when to go, not the raw speed. The raw speed is important, but it's not the most important in my opinion. Okay. Are there things that the that, that players that are listening to this right now should specifically be doing on their own or can, can do on their own? Totally. Um, Totally. One of, the big, one, yeah. one of the biggest things I see is this. People practice their take-on skills. So we do a lot of kind of 1v1s, David and I, SPI. He does loads of SPI OC. Like we'll do, we'll do a, a drills where we feel it's important that players, we always feel it's important as a player to be able to solve things on your own. So imagine you have no players on the field on your team. You can still make something happen. So we work a lot on 1v1s, being able to create your own shot, being able to create your own space. And so we do that. One of the biggest things I see is people doing take on moves and beating somebody, but not accelerating afterwards, not understanding that accelerating away is the, is a neuromuscular pattern that needs to be ingrained into your body. And so they'll do the move and then they'll just kind of like half kind of leg it away from it. And I'm like, Hey, that's the moment in the game where if you explode, you create a three or four meter gap It's finished. And so that, that's one of the things that I would definitely say that young kids need to work at is when you do your 1v1 skills is know when it's time to explode and absolutely 100% do it. And that will be a pattern and a pattern recognition that your body will kind of internalize. That's fantastic. That is one tip that I hope everybody really got and really heard well. Yeah. Once you create, you know, you get to your opponent leaning one direction and then you kind of lope away. They just recover again and they, 
you, you can do 17 moves and never beat the player, right? Yeah, and that's, and, mis and that's, that's yeah. misidentifying what you're trying to do. You're trying to break through. Always when you beat a player, it's because you want to break through behind them. That's fantastic. That's, that's just great advice. I love it. Um, okay, so I'm working out every day, right? And, and I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. And in fact, Nikki, David, you guys give me a, a whole plan, right? You, maybe you send me video sessions, you do whatever. And, but I don't eat well. What role does what a player eats on a regular basis, how they fuel their body, what role does that have in them getting actual physical results? Uh, huge. I, I, would, I would say, first of all, we it, it, you have different differences. Cause so I see a lot of young people on the video here. So their bodies are growing at the moment. Their bodies need certain things to, to build the building blocks of, um, of their physical body and synthesize into muscle mass. I would say that every human being needs three things to function. They need carbohydrates, which turn into glucose um, in, in the blood. They need oxygen and they need water. Those three things, if you have those three things, you can pretty much go and do a low level physical activity indefinitely. You probably need sleep at a certain point or, or you definitely need sleep, but you need glucose uh, in the form of car car carbohydrates in the form of glucose. You need oxygen and you need water. Those three things. Now, as you start to do different things like weight training, you need proteins, okay? Proteins are the building block. They're 27 amino acids or is it 29, 29, 27, amino acids that your body needs to, synth to take them and synthesize them into training. So when you do something really strong, like a big squat, or you do something like a chest press, what you're in, in, in reality doing is you're injuring your muscle, you're tearing your muscle. And what your body then needs to do is, is it repairs it and it builds it back. And what it does is it needs protein to synthesize into itself to build those layers onto um, your chest or your quads or whatever thing, whatever uh, muscle group that you're building. You need those. Now, that doesn't mean only eat protein because carbohydrates, which are also important, help deliver those proteins around the body. So, so what I would say is you need a balanced diet. You need a very balanced diet. And as a sports person and an athlete who wants to get the very best out of themselves, everything going into your body needs to eat. There's not, my, my son says to me, my son who's 11 says to me, is this good for me, dad, or is it bad for me? And I always say to him, there's no in between. It's either good or it's bad. There's nothing that's just in the middle. So think about what goes into your body. Is it good for you or is it bad? If it's bad for you, try not to put it in. I understand we're all human beings and we need, you know, we have, you know, cravings for sugar and fat and different things like that. And that's actually a survival, um, a genetics survival thing from, from our prehistoric days where calories, the way we identified when we were cavemen, the way we identified if a food had calories and calories is just a measurement of energy is if it was sweet or if we had the feeling that it had fat in it. And those are the two things we became very attuned at human beings to understand. If it has sugar or it has fat, it has calories and calories were energy and we needed energy to go catch our food. So we're predisposed to want those things. But now we have to understand as an athlete, we need to put those things in in the right order and they need to do things for our body. So what I would say is this, you need to make sure you're fueled always, you have enough fuel, enough calories in your body to, to, to take on the day, to take on a training session, to do what you need to do. Those calories are a m measurement of energy. So don't look at something and say, it has a lot of calories, it's bad for me, that's not true. Calories are just telling you how much energy is in that food. Within that food, you want to have a good balance of carbohydrates, which can be turned into blood sugar or a delivery vessel for the proteins. And you want to have a good amount of proteins that your body can get into it. You can have that through meat, but you can also have that through plants as well. All plants have a protein. In fact, plants are the only thing that can create protein from nitrate in the air. Animals have to eat plants to actually take the protein that the plants create and bring it into our body. So 
eat your vegetables, eat your broccoli. Is a, broccoli is 44% protein. Spinach, green, dark, leafy vegetables, they have more protein per calorie than any steak that you'll find. And, it's, and, it's, and it gives your body the protection it needs um, in terms of the vitamins uh, it needs to protect itself. So to sum it all up, I would say, in terms of eating and fueling yourself, no food is just average for you. A food is either good, a food is either bad. Try to have all of the foods that are good for you, that have protein, carbohydrates from a natural source, um, that have vitamins, so you need your vegetables, and fuel yourself properly because there's no car that runs. If you put junk in a car, it doesn't run properly. And the same with the body. If you want your body to run properly, you need to fuel it properly. I love it. And, and I will offer this to anybody listening. If you email me, I will send you a plant-based protein chart that will show you all the basic plants that you can buy in the store and how much protein each of them has in them. Just, just reach out to me and email me. I love it, Nikki. And I'm so glad you brought that up because everybody thinks of protein as chicken and, and meat and all of that. And while there's value in there, that's got fat in there that don't really help our body quite as much for the, I, I am all about plant protein and trying to get as yeah. much out of it as we can. Yeah. I love that. Great just, point. Just, yeah. Just, just remember that there is no animal that can make a protein. It must eat the vegetables to get that protein into it. The chicken has to eat the grain to get the protein in there. Then you have to eat the chicken. So, you know, I've, I've not eaten meat for like 11 years now. I've only eaten plants. So that's, I always advise, it's not an all or nothing, but I say the more plants you eat, the better. Okay, I'm, I'm not against eating meat for, for my clients, for my professional players, but the more vegetables, the better for sure. Okay, you know what I'd like to wrap this up with, guys? Okay, so we've got a very good player, and, and you, guys, you guys see players that are like, it, you know, that are UCLA players, right? I, I know you've got some clients in that category that are, that, that Pac-12, that Power 5 type collegiate player. What do you see being the difference between them and the players like Benteke that, that, that make it, that make it to that pro level? You know, you know, we all start, we all get to this point where, geez, everybody can dribble, everybody can pass, everybody can head a ball, everybody can, can receive a ball. And, and all of those technical bits and pieces I've noticed between the top collegiate players and the pro players are pretty similar. They're mm. pretty close. Mm. Um, but there's a difference. Mm. There's a little something that where one makes it and, and it may be mentality. I don't know. That's what I'm asking. In the clients that you guys deal with, what do you see as the difference between those that are very good that don't make it and those that are very good and make it? You know, I tend to feel that you need something in your game to be outstanding. So Christian, I would say, first of all, the pro players have extreme they're very good with their understanding, their understanding of the moments in the games of when to do things and how they interpret games and relate to all the players on the field is a high level. But what really sticks it out is there's, there's things that their pillars are higher. So Christian Benteke, his ability in the air is here. So it's so high that, that one thing that he does is almost enough to push him over the top. That if you put him in the box, I've seen him play against Virgil van Dijk and Virgil van Dijk wants no part of him in the air. Like his pillar at his aerial ability is so high. And so then he understands, okay, that's my game. So that's how I'm going to kind of uh, uh, base it around. And then they work at the finishing for those ones, maybe the physicality, that you tend to see that the physical physicality and that's not the fitness that is the pure power and strength I remember i said you needed the pillars of speed power and strength to be a pro and so those pillars are just higher right they are able to get those pillars higher and it's usually one of them like take nathan redmond who, who plays for Southampton. He is one of, my, one of my clients. And if you look at him, he looks like a normal human being. He's one of my players that looks like a normal person. Whereas Divock or Christian, they look like they could run over everybody, right? Nathan looks like you could see him in the street and go, oh, he's a player, right? But what he has, he has unbelievable speed and ability to dribble. So then he has one of his pillars 
that is right up there, right? And then his, maybe his finishing pillar is very high as well. And his understanding. So, so you need some of your pillars to be really high. And I think that's what takes, you need to work on the things that you're not good at, but you need to take the things that you're good at and make some of those pillars right up there. And that sets you apart from everybody else. I love it. That, that's great. D David, um, we well, want to begin to wrap this thing up here. So um, yeah. do, do you have, uh, have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, I, I mean, those are, those are all definitely the essential um, and the foundational knowledge that we all need. Uh, so, uh, but what I, what I can share is uh, at, at SPIOC, I deal with, um, we, uh, I specialize in youth players just like you guys. And we were very successful um, having players go to the, the top, top universities and also uh, the professional teams this season alone. Um, but there are some patterns that I see and also what uh, Nikki just talked about. If we relate that back to you guys, this is what it's all about. I think it's more about um, there's a limited amount of time for you guys to work on. Think about it. You, you don't, uh, until you get to a certain age, you have a set amount of time and you want to use it efficiently and wisely. And what I, and, and things that I tell uh, my players and the top, top players in, in the academy and, and, and in college where it changes their entire game is, I think we tend to focus on our weaknesses more than our strengths. And like what our Nikki just said, it's the strengths that get us there. It's not, right, it's not, it's not anything else, but it's our special strength. And I believe every one of you guys have that special strength. We are all genetically different. If I tell you guys to dribble, if, I, if, I, if we set up four cones in a line, I tell you guys to dribble, every one of you guys will dribble in a different way. Every one of you guys is special. You guys all have different uh, strengths. And, and, and it's our job to identify those strengths, not just weaknesses, but strengths where we work on them so that on the field, you guys enjoy it. You guys should be enjoying it on the field and having fun. And I think the higher level we go up to, we lose that. There are two things that I, the two biggest patterns that I see uh, with with the with uh, with our young players, young very talented players. You're either arrogant or not confident. It's really hard to find that balance um, in that mentality, and that's also part of our job. It's not just um, you know Nikki and I when we when we train players, we talk to them probably more than we train them, you know, um, and that's how we really that's how we really find that uh that inner talent and and that that boost that really gets gets them up there um and i one thing i really do want to share is three three more things real quick that as nikki was sharing all this time that i had in my head one thing is um everything's related right physical men physic physicality mentality you know uh understanding all of these things are related um one thing we need to really realize is number one Understand how to recover. I think that's also part of physicality. I, I think when you guys understand how to recover from that, from young age and really take care of your body in that way, um, not, only just, not only know how to go hard, but also bring it down and recover for the next session, extremely important. Number two, understand what 90 minutes mean. And it's not, in the 10,000 meters that you run in 90 minutes, only 800 meter is full sprint. Did you guys know that? So then, the the thing that you're we're training for what are you training for exactly what are you what are you running for what's that fitness for and if you guys understand what the 90 minute exactly mean it'll be uh you know your your training will be a lot more efficient and the last thing would be there's always technique in whatever you guys do uh explosiveness running work on that specific technique and that will that will shorten the time for example if you need a full year to understand how to do something without knowing what, how to do it versus if you know exactly what needs to be done, the technique that needs to be done, how, how do you then explode? How do you then you run? How do you dribble? And we have that kind of a, not, that, not, that knowledge. We can shorten the time of your development. It, you know, the 10 years that, might, that, might, that you might have to do to develop something, we can get you developed in a month. You know what I mean? There are technique and there are certain things that, that, uh, that knowledge uh, that 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 if you know would increase and would you know help you to develop faster. So look for that. Um, I you know that would be another thing that I would 
say. So those are those are the things that I have had in mind that I wanted to share. So guys, if somebody wants to get a hold of you guys, how would how would they get a hold of you to find out more information about about what you do? Um, so well, uh, you could contact us through. Um, uh, our website's launching in a, in a couple of days, but at the moment you can, you can get um, in contact with me through uh, my Instagram, which is Nikki Hollander um, on Instagram. And that's pretty much how most of the pro players will get hold of me. Um, so you can start that way and I can give you some advice that way. Um, and David, uh, you, your Instagram too at David Park, right? Yeah. So it's basically David YC Park. And then we'll, we'll be launching our website with all the pro players in the next couple of days. Fantastic. Well, guys, I, I, I'm really excited at our partnership with you guys. Uh, us at Sports Recruiting USA have just been, been thrilled with um, the information you've been able to give to our clients. And, and uh, I thank you guys for coming on today.